uh, I would say to members, we have no extra time in this debate, no spare time, so I would ask you all to adhere to timing guidelines, please. And I call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Scotland is a trading nation. For centuries, our businesses have travelled the globe to find and develop new markets. This Scottish Government understands the importance of trade to the success of our economy. That's why we take Scotland's role in trade negotiations seriously. I spend a large proportion of my time travelling the country, listening to businesses and business organisations, working with them to support their efforts to increase exports. And I hear their concerns about Brexit on a daily basis. Businesses unable to plan due to uncertainty and potential disruption. The threat to livelihoods and jobs. The impact of tariff and non-tariff barriers on trade and on businesses' ability to attract workers with the right skills. The risk to inward investment and no guarantees to prevent vital protections for some of Scotland's most iconic products being bargained away by a UK government desperate to do a deal. These concerns are reflected in the recent FSB poll of small businesses, which found that business confidence is decreasing as the threat of a no-deal Brexit grows. These concerns should be at the forefront of UK government thinking in their exit planning. Instead, we hear UK ministers accusing businesses of using Brexit as an excuse. By contrast, this Scottish government takes business seriously. That is why we need to address their fears by ensuring that Scotland has a voice in our future trading environment. The publication of our recent paper on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements forms an important part of the Scottish Government's preparation for exit from the EU. It clearly makes the case that we need to ensure Scotland's economic and social interests are protected and promoted, that the voice of Scotland's consumers, businesses and wider society are heard, and that the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government and others must have a guaranteed role in formulating and agreeing future trade deals. As members know, the Scottish Government continues to believe that the best option for the future well-being of Scotland and indeed of the UK as a whole is to remain in the EU. That position is consistent with the will of the people of Scotland who voted overwhelmingly to remain and they did so for powerful social and economic reasons. The benefits of EU membership to Scotland are crystal clear. The EU is the single market, largest market for Scotland's international exports. Six of Scotland's top ten export destinations are in the EU, a further two have trade agreements with the EU. Rather than choose to put our faith in new, unquantified trade deals which have yet to be negotiated, we recognise the value of current trading relationships. That is why we will continue to take every opportunity to put forward a robust case for remaining in the EU, the single market and the customs union. The UK government's approach is chaotic and is irresponsible. Its proposals now exposed as unworkable, unacceptable and heading towards a no-deal Brexit. Analysis after analysis, including that by the UK government itself, shows that continued membership of the European Single Market and Customs Union would be the least damaging option for a UK outside of the EU. Such membership would help to promote businesses, communities and individuals from protect, uh, businesses, communities and individuals from some of the inevitable damage Brexit will deliver. Even the most optimistic estimates of potential gains from new markets could not fully mitigate that damage. Yet remaining in the single market and customs union is an option the UK government still refuses to consider. President officer, the risks we are facing are not of Scotland's making, but as a responsible government, we need to make preparations for all possible scenarios, including leaving the EU single market and customs union. Mike Russell set out the Scottish government's coherent, consistent and collaborative approach to preparing for those scenarios in his recent statement to Parliament. Preparations ranging from ensuring a working statute book after exit to the practicalities of maintaining access to essential medicines and ensuring we have the right staff in place to meet the challenges Brexit will bring. Scotland's exporters are among our most productive and innovative businesses. Scotland's trade and investment strategy, Global Scotland, sets out the key actions and commitments we and our partners are taking to boost export performance and attract inward investment. The measures we have already taken to improve our trade performance are working, with Scotland's exports growing faster than those from the rest of the UK. We have established a trade board, appointed trade envoys to champion export opportunities at home and overseas. We have expanded our global network of offices, doubled our SDI presence in Europe and funded the establishment of local export partnerships across Scotland, working with the local chambers of commerce. 
Additional support has been delivered through our enterprise and skills agencies to help business prepare for the future of the programme, including help to create a Brexit-focused action plan, project support, online learning and skills workshops. Our £20 million programme for government commitment to support Scotland's export drive, helping the next wave of export-ready businesses. This will include peer-to-peer -peer export mentor programme being rolled out in connection with the CBI. And the ongoing work to develop our export plan, a trading nation, rigorously data-driven, taking input from business organisations, industry bodies, trade unions and others to pinpoint where we should focus resources to maximise Scotland's export growth potential. Indeed. Martin Fraser. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. He's more than, more than five minutes into his speech and we've yet to hear very much about the subject of this debate, which is future trade arrangements being negotiated by the UK. So can he tell us, is it the position of the Scottish Government that it believes that devolved administrations should have a right of veto over future trade policy? Ivan McKee. Mr Fraser would know if he'd read the motion that the first part of the motion talks about the importance of trade to Scotland's businesses and that's exactly what I've been talking about for the first part of my contribution. Um, and if he listens to the rest of the speech, he will get the answer to his question. But the short answer is no, but he will hear the answer as he listens to the rest of my contribution. Side so, officer, Brexit may not be our choice, but we are working with business to give them the tools to best meet the challenges it creates. And we are focused on the decision-making processes that should underpin how future trade deals are made. Deals that have profound consequences for our businesses and citizens. That is the purpose of our recently published paper, Scotland's Role in the Development of Future UK Trade Arrangements. Outside of the EU, the UK will become a third country. As such, it will become responsible for negotiating its own international trade deals with the EU and with others. The UK will lose substan the EU's substantial negotiating power, scrutiny and expertise. But within the UK, the arrangements currently in place for the development of trade deals are already inadequate, out of date and in need of an urgent and radical overhaul. In affording so minimal a role to the UK Parliament, to devolved institutions and to business and civic interests, existing arrangements have failed to keep pace with constitutional developments within the UK. That should be changed now. Even if the UK remains in the EU and customs union, the UK Parliament, devolved institutions and others must have a proper voice in the agreement of future trade deals. Current arrangements have also failed to keep pace with global developments, including in the nature of trade deals themselves. Earlier trade deals focused on tariffs and quotas, now they have a much broader scope, potentially affecting a wide range of devolved interests. Their effects are felt across all sectors of society, by our businesses and citizens. Democratic scrutiny of these arrangements and the enduring impact they have must be increased and improved to reflect that. Indeed. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister giving way and, and perhaps by way of balancing the intervention from Murdo Fraser earlier, now that the Minister is talking about the potential impact on devolved areas of future trade agreements, isn't it clear that this Parliament and other devolved uh, jurisdictions within these islands should have the ultimate say on whether those trade agreements do impact and curtail or constrain devolved competencies? Yes, in, McKee. yes, indeed. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Harvey makes a very strong point and is absolutely correct. That need for change, of course, becomes considerably more urgent and necessary if the UK leaves the EU single market and customs union. Scotland, as we know, often has very different trade priorities from other parts of the UK. Different sectors are important to Scotland's economy. Only one of Scotland's top five EU export sectors appears in the equivalent UK list. Scotland's key sectors need to be protected and the inevitable horse trading that forms a part of any trade negotiations. Scotland has specific protected geographical indications crucial to our export performance. When UK government ministers are unable, even at this early stage, to commit themselves to ensuring that protection remains in place in future deals, Scotland's businesses have a right to be concerned. How we trade tells us a lot about who we are as a society and the values we have. In our approach to protecting our environment, our public services, our workers' rights, Scotland's Parliament and Government have consistently shown a different set of priorities, reflecting wider Scottish public opinion. It would clearly be unacceptable, for example, for a UK Government to impose trade deals that opened up Scotland's NHS to private competition or opened up our markets to chlorine-washed chicken or hormone-injected beef. Scotland is a voice at the table to ensure our priorities are not ignored. The development, conduct and content of future trade deals will increasingly have very important implications for Scotland. 
yet the UK government is making no proposals for change to change existing and out-of-date arrangements. That cannot be right. So far, the UK government's record on this is not a good one. Its approach to the EU Withdrawal Act, the Trade Bill and the imposition of common frameworks have all demonstrated their willingness to curtail devolved powers. The UK government has talked a good game about giving the devolved institutions a proper place and about dividing trade deals at work for the whole of the UK, but the reality is somewhat different. When put to the test, the struggle to treat Scotland and other devolved nations as anything more than narrow sectoral interests. At best, we are merely offered the chance to comment on already well-developed proposals. Decision-making process must recognise, respect and protect the economic and social interests of all four nations of the UK. To ensure that Scotland's voice is heard and respected and to protect and promote the interests and ambitions of our businesses and citizens, the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament must have a guaranteed role in all stages of the formulation, negotiation, agreement and implementation of future trade deals. Indeed. Dean Lockhart. Can the Minister confirm that still the Scottish Government's policy to have a differentiated approach to Europe which would hand back all trade powers to Brussels? Ivan McKee. Uh, yes, of course it's our objective to have a different, uh, trade, a different policy from that of the rest of the UK no, with, with regard to Europe, but that does not mean that uh, what the, the member said would fall into place, absolutely not. Our paper sets out in great detail what that involvement might look like. It also, and this is crucial, proposes the establishment and statute of a new intergovernmental committee to consider and agree a range of trade issues. That approach would be in everyone's interest. Domestically, it will ensure that negotiations are conducted based on a full understanding of the issues. And wider afield, it will provide reassurance to the UK's current and future negotiating partners that there is a consensus across the UK for potentially difficult and lengthy trade negotiations. And that once agreements are stuck, they will endure. Scotland wants to be a constructive part to the other nations of the UK and a fair trading partner to countries around the world. The, the benefits of a more inclusive approach to development of trade and arrangements are widely recognised and welcomed internationally. The EU demonstrates the value it places on such an approach by ensuring that representatives from the Canadian provinces were fully involved in the CETA negotiations. But while we can learn much from those examples, the circumstances faced in the UK are unique and so must the response. I want to finish today by emphasising that our paper on Scotland's role in the development of future trade arrangements seeks to open a discussion, recognising that others, including this Parliament, must have their say. I look forward to a wide-ranging and constructive debate this afternoon as the next stage in that discussion. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. I now call Adam Tompkins to speak to and move amendment 1459.2, up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, as members will know, I didn't vote for Brexit, but I did think about it. And while I did not agree with everything, and I still don't agree with everything that the Brexiteers said in the referendum campaign, they did have some powerful arguments on their side. To reduce the influence in the UK's legal systems of the European Court of Justice is one of the welcome opportunities that Brexit should deliver. Another is to allow us to take back control, as the slogan has it, of our international trading links. Britain is and always has been a trading nation. Our economic prosperity as a nation is rooted in trade, in the modern economy, in services, as well as in goods. The UK has a long and proud history not only as a trading nation, but as a global champion of free trade. Why? Not only because it benefits the UK economy, but because it delivers benefits for businesses, for workers, and for consumers alike. Trade is a key driver of growth and prosperity. It is linked directly to jobs. Free trade leads to higher wages, economic growth, business efficiency, higher productivity, knowledge exchange, and innovation across the globe. And at the same time, free trade ensures that more people can access a wider choice of goods at lower cost, making household incomes go further, especially for the poorest in society. To take back control of all of this is perhaps the greatest opportunity that Brexit now affords. And I make these introductory, indeed elementary, points, presiding officer, because they need making. We face today not only a rising tide of protectionism, in a number of the world's major economies, but also closer to home, real antipathy, especially on the hard left, to the idea of free trade at all. 
The Finance and Constitution Committee, taking evidence on the UK's trade bill, has heard from a number of individuals and organisations that international free trade is a threat, not a route map from poverty to prosperity, and that it should be resisted, not welcomed, in, in one minute. Um, and that theme was echoed, I thought, in Patrick Carvey's amendment uh, for today, albeit that that amendment was not selected for debate. There are members of this parliament, presiding officer, who don't believe in growth um, and who would seek to resist the role of free trade in delivering it. Those of us who are economic liberals who believe in free trade would be making a mistake if we assumed that the argument for it had been won and can be taken for granted. Happily give way to the Minister. Ivan McKee. Uh, if uh, Adam Tompkins is so keen on extolling the virtues of free trade, with which I agree, why is he supportive of the largest single backward step we've ever taken away yeah. from free trade, which is Brexit? Or are we about to hear a re-reconversion in his conversion back to being a Remainer? Indeed. Adam Tompkins. A absolutely not. I mean, the Brexit delivers the ex exactly the opportunity for Scotland and for the United Kingdom as a whole to uh, trade more freely with the whole of the rest of the world's economy, including all of the fastest growing economies in the world, which are outside of the EU. As a trade minister, one would have hoped might, might know. Presiding officer, it has always been our firm belief and it continues to be on these benches our firm belief that Brexit can and must be delivered compatibly with the United Kingdom's devolution arrangements. And this means respecting what is properly devolved to us, but it also means respecting what is reserved to Westminster. Under Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act, international relations, including relations with the European Union, and the regulation of international trade are all expressly reserved to Westminster. These are matters, presiding officer, not for us, but for our parliamentary colleagues in the House of Commons. They are matters in respect of which Scotland is, of course, fully represented, but not by the Scottish Government, but by the 59 MPs Scotland elects at every general election to serve in the House of Commons. Respecting all this is part of what respecting devolution means. And if this constitutional reality had been the foundation on which the Scottish Government's paper, Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade agreements, had been based, that paper would have commanded far greater support, not only across the political parties here, but in Westminster and Whitehall too. I fear I don't have time. I'm sorry, Mr. Scott. But this is the, pap but this is the paper, of course, of an SNP government. So, of course, it doesn't respect the boundaries of devolved competence at all. Rather than being based on the division of powers and responsibilities set out in the Scotland Act 1998, it takes a wrecking ball to the Scotland Act. For example, on page five of the document, we read this, and I quote, the conduct and content of future trade policy, negotiations and agreements have very important implications to Scotland, and it is vital that the Scottish Government is fully involved in the process for determining them. That's a nationalist power grab, presiding officer, asserting as it does that the Scottish Government must be fully involved in the processes for determining policy that is expressly reserved to Westminster. Worse, not merely content with trampling all over reserved competence, the SNP are demanding a series of five vetoes over the exercise by UK ministers of their powers. According, according to this document, no let, no, no, let me make the point. According to this document, the agreement of the Scottish Government should be required, not merely sought, but required, that's what a veto is, Mr. Russell, before any proposed trade deal is prepared, negotiated, ratified, or signed. Now, the uh, Scottish Government's motion for today calls on uh, the uh, Parliament to support the idea that we should support international best practice in the negotiation of trade deals. But what the Scottish Government propose in this wrecking ball of a paper goes significantly further than international best practice, even in uh, uh, mature federal jurisdictions uh, such as uh, Canada. In Canada, the provinces are consulted about, uh, by the federal government about the federal uh, uh, um, competence of international trade uh, and international relations. The, the provinces are consulted. They don't have a veto. The Scottish Government is proposing not merely one veto, but a series of five Mr. vetoes on a matter um, which is not uh, even uh, devolved. Uh, Presenting officer, we agree uh, with the uh, Scottish Government that international best practice should be observed as the United Kingdom unfolds its future trade uh, partnerships and negotiations. But international best practice is not understood by the Scottish Government. Indeed, in their paper, it has been misrepresented 
uh, by the Scottish Government. International best practice has been articulated recently to the Finance Committee of this Parliament by UK Government Ministers, such as the Minister for Trade, George Hollingbury, who said this, and I quote, I confirm that it is the Department's clear, the Department of International Trade's clear intent and desire to take the concerns of the Scottish Government and the other devolved authorities about their trade policy extremely seriously. These are, he said, very important industries. Uh, it, there are, he said, very important industries in Scotland and very important issues to consider. And we, he said, will continue the contacts at official level at as deep a level and for as long a time as we can so that we can shape our overall trade policy such that it reflects the interests of the devolved authorities. That's exactly what international best practice requires. It's exactly what the United Kingdom government Please, has um, agreed to. And it's exactly, presiding officer, and I'll close with this remark, it's exactly what our amendment to today's motion calls for. Um, the uh, international trade will require effective and extensive collaborative working between all parliaments and assemblies and governments in the United Kingdom. The UK government's already signed up to that. It would, be, it would be nice if the Scottish government could as well. I move the amendment in my name. I call Jackie Bailey for up to six minutes, please. Presiding officer, the only word to describe current Brexit negotiations is shambolic. I am perhaps being too kind. We are witnessing a prime minister who is out of her depth in negotiations with the EU. Her checkers proposals lies in tatters. The prospect of no deal becomes increasingly a reality and her Tory cabinet are more interested in fighting amongst themselves than in getting the best possible outcome for the country. Now the chaos and uncertainty is bad for business, it's bad for the economy and it's bad for the people of this country. And do you know with six months to go, it doesn't look like it's getting any better. That chaos and uncertainty has manifested itself in the latest business confidence figures published by the FSB and referred to by the Minister. Excuse the me, Ms Bailey, would you please stop muttering, Mr Fraser? You may get a chance to speak yourself later on. Ms Bailey. I suspect his muttering is better than his speech. <laughs> Presiding officer, um, in the third quarter of 2018, Business con confidence has fallen in Scotland and in the UK. In Scotland, it's down from plus 5.1 to minus 13.2. Most, if not all of it, down to Brexit itself. And when people hear the government are planning to stockpile medicines and foodstuffs, they begin to understand the severity of the consequences. Of course, none of those consequences were ever spelled out as slogans on the side of a bus. So we need to avoid rushing headlong into a disaster for our economy and for jobs. And one of the essential pieces of legislation to try and avoid this is, of course, the Trade Bill. Let me say at the outset that the Scottish Labour Party is pro-trade and pro-investment. We want to see the Scottish economy flourish and grow. And that means support for exporting, support for inward investment to create jobs and economic growth. And we know that trade is fundamental to economic growth. An outward-looking economy will lead to future prosperity. But we really need to do better now, never mind in the future. Only something like 70 companies account for about 50% of our exporting, and that's simply not good enough. Economists tell us that we do the most trade with our nearest neighbours, and we do some £12 billion of trade with the EU. We need to deepen and broaden that activity. So the trade bill should provide the framework for how we do trade deals in the future. A strong economy post-Brexit will depend on us having a robust and progressive trade policy that actually reflects the interests of the devolved administrations as well as the UK government. But unfortunately, the trade bill falls short on that ambition. There are two main issues I want to touch on, presiding officer. The first relates to openness and engagement. What the UK government is proposing is akin to doing deals behind closed doors. Now in Scotland, indeed across the UK, we have a wealth of talent and experience in NGOs, in trade unions, and in business. They should be central and involved in this. And if we're being brutally honest, there is little capacity and experience in Whitehall to negotiate trade deals because we haven't had to do it for 40 years. Let's look at what CBI Scotland had to say. They call for the setting up of a formalized engagement architecture for the UK that uses trade expertise from Scotland and across the UK, especially from the private sector. I see nothing like that proposed in the trade bill. The second substantial issue is about the impact on devolved competence. It doesn't really help 
and Adam Tompkins will understand this as a constitutional lawyer, that the Trade Bill and EU Withdrawal Bill deviates from the Scotland Act of 1998 in the definition of devolved competence. That creates confusion and uncertainty and perhaps more work for lawyers. But whilst competence for international trade agreements does rest with the UK government, I think we all can agree that the complexity and extent of modern agreements means that they will directly impact on devolved competence. There are some exa examples that we've all shared, food standards, animal welfare standards, access to fishing waters, regulatory and oversight bodies. The list goes on. It is essential and right that devolved parliaments are consulted and that consent is sought. The Tory government has singularly failed to make clear that its powers do not allow for ministerial overreach and that UK ministers cannot amend laws that are a matter of devolved competence without consent. Instead, what we see, a sweeping Henry VIII powers, and I know the SNP like those as well, to modify primary legislation. And I'm very clear that the Tory government shouldn't be allowed to ride roughshod over devolved areas of responsibility and use their powers to undermine the devolution settlement. That said, I do not expect the Scottish Government to have a right of veto either. The business community, the whole of the country, expect joint working, consultation, yes, robust debate and discussions before and during the process. They want us to come to agreements about what's in the interest of Scotland and the whole of the United Kingdom. And to do that, we need government machinery, perhaps a more robust version of the Joint Ministerial Committee where agreement can be reached in the interests of the whole country. And unless, unless there is formal and agreed machinery, a statutory role for the Scottish Parliament and government in the UK Trade Bill, we will not agree to legislative consent. Call Patrick Harvey for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, three speeches in, and I've already heard something from everybody that I can agree with. Uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, excoriating de demolition of the chaos of Brexit could not be more accurate. Uh, the, the minister very clearly making the case why the uh, devolved countries of these islands do need a meaningful input into future trade agreements uh, I couldn't agree with more. And, and Adam Tompkins very clearly expressed his regret that Parliament doesn't today have the opportunity to debate my excellently worded an amendment. And I, of course, agree with him uh, on that. Look, we, of course, have political and ideological differences uh, from left to right of the spectrum uh, and for a, a more and less uh, uh, concerned attitude uh, on environmental uh, and green issues there are differences in the consequent trade policies that we would like to pursue. There are those who have a free trade mantra, who assume that free trade is always a good thing in every aspect. And just as Greens often criticize uh, a single-minded and a myopic obsession with GDP growth, which measures only one thing and tells you nothing about the, the diversity of the impacts that economic activity is happening. We also critique the idea that simply ever-growing volumes of ever-freer trade are an objective good. There will be benefits that come uh, from that activity, but there will also be harms, social and economic harms, that come from that activity. And so we would like a, a trade policy which recognizes our responsibility. It's not merely to achieve short-term economic benefit for our, our own uh, citizens or for uh, a, a fair share of those benefits within the different countries of these islands. But we would like a trade policy which recognizes a mutual interest of the people around the world and the need to live within the limits that our ecosystem lays down for us. That might mean increasing the value of trade rather than the volume of trade. It might mean trading different things than we've traded in the past. It certainly means recognizing the importance of trade justice rather than merely the opportunity of those uh, pursuing trade opportunities uh, to, to benefit their own businesses. The need to achieve trade justice uh, is, is one which is about the relationship with those we're trading with, not merely the interests of those in this country who wish to increase their exports. So there is this range of 
philosophical, political, and ideological objectives when we debate trade and, and the future of trade within our economy. And that difference of views is exactly why the process of agreeing trading arrangements needs to be transparent and democratically accountable. I would like to make a, a contrast, not with whether we uh, decide these things in, a, in a, a, a multilateral basis in future within these islands or merely within the UK. Let's contrast it with the way these things are decided at EU level. And there are those who are implacably hostile to everything the European Union represents. I don't think they're the majority here. But when TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, was being debated at European Union level, and when member states, including the UK, were supporting TTIP, a great wave of concern grew up uh, across the European Union, in this country and in many other countries, about the impact of TTIP, about the lack of accountability in some of the legal decisions that would be made with panels of corporate lawyers essentially deciding behind closed doors any dispute resolution uh, mechanisms. And the need was brought to, to have these ideas challenged. The European Parliament was able to do that. People were able to campaign, take their concerns to their political parties, to their domestic representatives at home, and to their MEPs, and the European Parliament won the case on behalf of the public interest on that occasion. It doesn't always happen. Of course, it doesn't always happen that that, that kind of public concern wins out. But it was at least a possibility. The UK government's initial proposals for the trade bill had an absolute absence of those kind of democratic accountability mechanisms uh, in their proposals. And they have changed little. They have certainly not changed enough. Now, of course, uh, Adam Tompkins and others uh, may make the case, trade policy is a reserved matter. Trade policy is a reserved matter, end of story. That is not the end of the story. The making of trade agreements may well be a reserved matter, but the content of them steps very heavily onto devolved areas of responsibility. And that's why we have a need, as I think Jackie Bailey ended by saying, not only ensuring that there is dialogue between governments, but formalizing the mechanism so that parliaments as well are able to hold the decisions governments, plural, make on these matters. And that has to mean not just the Westminster Parliament, but all parliaments and assemblies throughout these islands. I'll finish, presiding officer, just by flagging up quite what some of the ardent Brexiteers are looking to do. In preparing for the visit of Liz Truss, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, to the Finance and Constitution Committee this week, I was reading a speech she made at the far-right libertarian Cato Institute recently. I had to choke back my incredulity at some of this absurd speech. The Cato Institute, which is deeply implicated with those who made a killing by kicking off the climate denial uh, industry, who've argued against sensible environmental measures to protect the public interest. The, the kind of free market ideologues who genuinely want a ripping up of regulations. And Liz Truss's speech on this, complaining about a thicket of regulations to protect people, is absolutely dire warning of what some of these people wish to do if we do not have an accountable and democratic means of achieving debate on trade policy in future. I call Tavish Scott for up to six minutes, please. Also, there are many speeches being made in uh, Blackpool today, but um, the one that will probably lead the news tonight is what uh, President Trump is currently saying in New York at the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, my concern about a debate on, debate on trade um, here in Scotland, but in a broader sense, is that we are facing once more another binary choice that we face in so many parts of public policy at the moment between economic nationalism on one hand and free trade uh, on the other. I don't suspect there'll be much sucker for uh, Patrick Harvey or anyone else from uh, Trump in uh, New York this afternoon. It's trade his way or the highway, to coin a phrase that seemed to have been emanating from Salzburg uh, last uh, week. I also wonder if this debate isn't a little academic for most businesses out there in the real world actually trying to make a living uh, at the moment. I've, because of oil and gas and one or two other sectors, been uh, very close to a lot of businesses in the last uh, week. And I keep asking them uh, what they expect of government, wherever that government may be, uh, around trade policy and around uh, 
the uh, imminent uh, arrival of something on Brexit. I take uh, Jackie Bailey's uh, point on what we may uh, face. And what they ask for is uh, some clarity. And if they can't have clarity, they'd at least like to know their governments are planning on their behalf for whatever the eventualities uh, may be. Now, I've dug through some of these EU uh, uh, exit notes from the UK government. Inter interestingly, there's no one on fisheries, despite that being an important industry to many parts uh, of uh, Scotland. Uh, but what there is one, but what there is one on is on uh, trade and in particularly on uh, freight. And what the uh, uh, Freight Transport Association said on the Today programme this morning was that British truck drivers, uh, if there is a, a no-deal Brexit, uh, will no longer have automatic access to European countries. That will affect between 95 and 97 per cent of the trucks that currently leave uh, all parts of uh, the UK cross, and cross the border uh, into Europe. And there is no certainty on bilateral agreements. So if you're uh, exporting fish from uh, Lerwick or from uh, Mark, Mike Russell's uh, constituency on the west coast of Scotland, if you're one of those businesses, you have not a scooby-doo as to what will happen uh, next uh, March. Uh, and the uh, vision of the M25, the whole of Kent becoming a lorry park looks more and more uh, serious. Uh, so I would uh, ask uh, our government here in Scotland uh, to spend some considerable time uh, planning uh, what the Scottish response would be to those eventualities. It's all very well producing policy papers on a trade bill. There's, uh, we'll come on to that. I want to come on to that in a minute. But uh, the hard uh, reality for export businesses that the minister mentioned in his opening remarks is what the devil is going to happen under the different scenarios uh, that this country uh, now uh, faces. And that uh, is, why, is, is where I think government attention should be concentrating uh, on. Uh, the second point I want to make is on intergovernmental machinery, a, a to topic that uh, a number of us under Bruce Crawford's chairmanship in a previous um, parliament spent uh, all too much uh, time on. And there's nothing much in here uh, on that. And I'd encourage the government to do uh, rather more uh, on that. Because what uh, this document doesn't include is anything on any kind of dispute uh, resolution mechanism. That's what does happen in most international countries, in federal structures or in quasi-federal structures. It's the advice that uh, uh, the uh, that uh, constitutional committee under Mr. Crawford's chairmanship took over many uh, weeks in the last uh, parliament. And I think it's the uh, crux of this issue. Had our motion been, or rather our amendment been selected today by the PO, uh, I'd have talked to that in more depth. But it just seems to me uh, that any uh, normal functioning country, and we are not that at the moment, I fully grant you that, um, but any normal functioning uh, country looks closely at the mechanisms and constantly refines them, yes, of course, into how uh, governments in the different parts of this, the UK, uh, can work uh, on that. It's not about vetoes, it's about dispute uh, resolution. Uh, and that is the experience of international affairs. The Canadian example is uh, clear uh, on that in relation to the roles, role of the provinces uh, and the way in which the, uh, the federal structure uh, ultimately decides uh, policy. And that is the bit that I wish government take, would take away from this uh, debate today in the area of intergovernmental uh, machinery. Uh, the last point um, I, I want to make is, is where we are in terms of uh, the Brexit uh, negotiations and why that uh, matters. And it's because of those uh, businesses who seek uh, that clarity that no longer exists and never has. Uh, no matter how long this goes on, uh, and no matter what happens as to whether and what the meaningful vote is in the House of Commons uh, later uh, this year. Uh, the job of government here in Scotland in, this, in the context of this trade policy is to make sure that Scottish business uh, has as much clarity as it has, which certainly doesn't exist at this time. That concludes the opening speeches and we now move to the open debate. Uh, contributions of six minutes, please. We're very pushed for time. I give due warning that I may have to cut time off later speakers. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Myrtle Fraser. I thank you, President Officer. In just six short months, against her will, Scotland will in all likelihood be leaving the European Union. My own constituency of Stirling voted by over two-thirds to remain in the European Union. People right across my constituency face being greatly affected by the economic uncertainty and hardship that anything but full access to the single market and customs union will bring. As we all know, analysis by both the Scottish Government and the UK Governments agree, and that in itself is unusual. 
that in any circumstances, exiting the EU will have a negative impact on the Scotland's economy. In the face of this evidence and the rhetoric from the Prime Minister, is any wonder that the notion of a no-deal exit from the EU is causing huge concern? The current political impasse could easily lead us to feel deeply pessimistic about Scotland's future relationship with the rest of the world. And I concede to having moments of great despondency over the future we face, no, not for myself, uh, for, but for my children and my grandchildren. Just to how do I go about explaining to my grandchildren, when they're old enough to comprehend, why the UK chose to turn its back on an organisation brought into being to avoid future conflict and war in Europe. Now, there are a few of these moments of despondency during the Finance and Constitution Committee to visit to Brussels last week, but I want to move on from that shortly, particularly so when some Bavarian elected members we met were also deeply concerned and equally emotional about the prospects of the UK leaving the EU. It was a timely reminder for me that there are many millions of people across the European Union who will feel a deep sense of loss if the UK departs, just as keenly as many of us will. But it was also during the same visit I came to realise that it's time for me to, fa to face up to the potential reality of leaving the EU and to do all I can to help ensure that Scotland has a positive and constructive voice and helping shape future trade deals. I think we all need to begin to work as constructively as we can. We need to, change, we need to have a different dialogue to build trust and create a framework within these islands on how we'll deal positively with matters of trade in future. And it's in this light I would sincerely ask opposition members to view the contribution of the Scottish Government's discussion paper published over the summer on Scotland's role in future trading arrangements. The paper describes four models that enable sub-states to have a role in the development, negotiation, ratification of trading treaties, including international trade deals. Rightly, the Scottish Government has indicated, though, no preference for one model, giving all parties an opportunity who have an interest in this debate to discuss what is right for Scotland. Whatever your view is, it's time to begin a real debate and how Scotland can be best involved in giving us the tools to make better decisions for the Scottish economy. For my part, I learned a huge amount from the representatives of Germany, Switzerland, Norway and Canada during the committee's visit to Brussels about how to create more positive and sustainable working relationships. And I'm sure my colleagues who took part in the visit would testify to the same positive experience. Interestingly, in Canada, Yes, the, the, the states are involved, sorry, the provinces are involved in international trade negotiations, but they've got an opt-in process in Canada for the provinces there, which is a different pr pr prospect to any imposition. The most significant lesson for me, though, was a common theme across all countries, was the sheer level of deep engagement of sub-states and regions in the development of a state government's position. It's clear that early and continual engagement and participation in the development of a state's position was a prerequisite to avoiding conflict and the need for the dispute resolution mechanisms that Tavis Scott rightly touched upon. Yes, that inevitably means investing more time in discussion and exploring the areas for potential consensus. But consensus and an agreed way forward was the normal outcome, avoiding the need to be involved in time-consuming and costly dispute mechanisms or indeed court proceedings. The fact that the structures for seeking agreement were normally formally laid down in statute, recognising the distinctive role and responsibilities of the state and sub-state, I have no, no doubt added to obtaining successful outcomes. But the imposition of the state's position on sub-states was glaringly missing from these arrangements. Such was the confidence and trust created through regular meetings and discussion that in some cases the sub-states were involved in the actual negotiations themselves, either leading or taking part as observers. Now, obviously, I passionately believe in Scotland being responsible for our own decisions as an independent country. Others will see devolution needing to be enhanced, giving Scotland a much greater role 
in trade arrangements, while well, some will be content to accept the simple status quo. But whatever the shape of Scotland's future constitutional arrangements are, we need to press the reset button on our relationship with the rest of the UK. And we can begin that journey today by agreeing it's time to engage in a positive debate about building a new landscape for future relations to enable mutual respect and trust to be built, because that will be absolutely crucial for the future. We owe it to future generations, my grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren, to at least try. Thank you, President Officer. I call Myrtle Fraser to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The uh, starting point for this debate on trade is that we are in new territory as far as the negotiation of future trade deals is concerned. For more than 40 years as a member of the EU, we have had no capacity to negotiate separate trade deals as the UK. As we leave the EU, that new possibility comes into place. And it gives far greater opportunity for Scotland, for the people of Scotland, for this Parliament, to be involved in the negotiation process than was ever the case whilst we were members of the EU. The UK government plans all future trade deals to go through extensive public consultation, including with the devolved administrations, before then needing approval from Parliament to be ratified. And in case there is any doubt about this, that this means that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government will have a say in the approach to negotiations throughout the consultation period and throughout the entire negotiation process. But in saying that, it is important to stress that there are few distinct interests for Scotland as opposed to the rest of the UK in trade policy. So the interests of Scottish farmers in relation to international trade will be very similar to the interests of farmers in East Anglia. The interests of Scottish manufacturers will be the same as the manufacturers in other parts of the UK like the Midlands. And the interests, I will in a second, and the interests of exporters, whether of food and drink or anything else in Scotland, will be very similar to the interests of exporters in Wales or Northern Ireland. I'll give way to Mr Mason. John Mason. Uh, I thank Mr Fraser for giving way. Would you accept that while the interest within a sector might be quite similar, the size of sectors uh, is, is quite different and a, a sector that's very important in Scotland is not so important in England? Margo Fraser. I'm not sure size matters, Mr Mason. I think what's more important is the fact that you have a government that's aware of the importance of trade and is aware that there are sectoral interests reflected across the whole United Kingdom regardless of size, which do have to have their interests protected. And I think that's exactly the approach the UK government is going to take. And it's also worth making the point that we have a closely aligned economy in Scotland with the rest of the UK, and that the UK's domestic market accounts for 61% of Scottish exports. And nothing should be done that disrupts that internal marketplace. Now, different countries approach negotiations to trade in different ways, according to their constitutional arrangements. Ruth Crawford has just mentioned last week's uh, visit to Brussels with the Finance and Constitution Committee. Members who met the uh, Norway representatives heard that negotiation of trade is a matter for the Norwegian government as part of EFTA. And there is no uh, direct regional input into that process, but the Norwegian parliament has a vote on whether to ratify any trade agreement. We also heard from the German lander that whilst they have a consultative role in trade policy, Ultimately, this is a federal matter, and it is a federal government in Germany that takes the final decisions. And as Adam Tompkins has said, well, no, I need to make some progress, if forgive me, Mr. Mr. Crawford. In terms of our devolution settlement in the UK, it is quite clear this is a reserved matter. But that does not mean there should not be consultation with the devolved administrations. As the Minister of State for Trade Policy, George Hollingbury, said when he came to the Finance and Constitution Committee on the 5th of September, the UK government is committed to engaging with the Scottish government and it will listen to what both it and the other devolved authorities have to say about trade policy extremely seriously. His stated aim was, and I quote, so that we can shape our overall trade policy such that it reflects the interests of the devolved authorities. Now there are of course two ways in which the Scottish interest in future trade policy can be represented. Firstly, we have Scottish members of parliament in Westminster fully engaged in the process. They have a direct route into the UK government, and ultimately it will be the Westminster Parliament that has to ratify any trade deal that is agreed. And secondly, as we've heard, there will be consultation with this parliament and the Scottish government in relation to trade policy. 
But what, however, is clear from the UK government's approach is that while there will be a consultative role for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government and with other devolved administrations, what there will not be is a right of veto over trade policy because that would not be in line with our constitutional settlement and would not be respecting the devolution process. And consultation should not stop at a government or parliamentary level. We have to consider the interests of business, particularly those of exporters who want to see frictionless trade across the world. There is also the consumer interest, and there's been extensive engagement from Civic Scotland around the, the trade bill process. Now, we should be wary of some of the scare stories we have heard about international trade agreements. It is not the case, for example, that future trade arrangements are going to see us force feeding our children chlorinated chicken or selling off the NHS to the highest bidder amongst US corporate interests. Indeed, George Hollingbury was very specific on both these points when I put them to him at his recent visit to the Finance and Constitution Committee. UK trade policy is not going to allow either of these things to happen. And I think the Minister would be taken more seriously on these issues, frankly, if he stopped the scaremongering and started looking at the opportunities from future trade uh, rather than scaring people as he has been doing. Mr Fraser's closing. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the negotiation of international trade is a great opportunity for both the UK and Scottish economies. Giving any evidence to the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Committee on the 10th of September, James Withers, Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink, said trade outside the EU is a game-changing opportunity for international exports. Similar views have been expressed by the Scotch Whiskey Association and a whole range of other sectoral interests. These are the views and the approaches we should be championing here in this Parliament and seeing international trade as a real benefit to be promoted. Thank you. Paul John McAlpine to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's now more than 18 months since the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee of this Parliament published a report on determining Scotland's future relationship with the European Union. What strikes me listening to the contributions today is how little progress has been made since our report warned about Scotland's vulnerability in post-Brexit trade policy. The committee explored future trading relationships as part of this inquiry, taking into consideration written evidence from more than 150 different organisations and individuals, as well as oral evidence from key stakeholders and expert witnesses. The committee recognised at a very early stage the need for Scotland to be involved in negotiating trade deals after the UK has left the EU. The report reached this unanimous conclusion, and I quote, we recommend that a means is found to involve the Scottish Government in bilateral and quadrilateral discussions on future trade deals. And it goes on to suggest a joint ministerial committee on international trade. Although since then it has become clear that the current GMC set up has not respected the devolved administrations and that to be effective, an, inter an intergovernmental committee on trade must treat as an, e as an equal partner within the UK. The committee spent time examining the Canadian approach where every single province sat round the table to negotiate the CETA agreement with the EU. And we heard from Christos Siros, the Agent General of the Quebec Government's Office in London, who told us that even before the negotiations with the EU on CETA, there has been an ongoing permanent mechanism called Sea Commerce, Canada Commerce, that brings together officials from the various provinces on the issues that are being negotiated by Canada. And we also studied the situation in Belgium, where regional parliaments can conclude international treaties in relation to their exclusive devolved competences, Flanders is partner to more than 600 treaties and agreements. The UK government takes the opposite approach, a centralised approach. And earlier this year, the British Chambers of Commerce, the CBI, the Federation of Small Businesses and the Institute for Export and International Trade called for the involvement of the devolved administrations and legislators throughout the Brexit process including their full involvement in the process of mandate preparation, oversight and, critically, approval of trade deals. That view is shared by the 27 organisations who make up the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition. And in a briefing for today's debate, they say that as it stands, the UK Trade Bill contains nothing that would give the Scottish Government 
or the Scottish Parliament the right to scrutinise or amend trade deals. In other words, Scotland will have no role in the ratification of these deals as things stand. The UK government has argued that there is no need. It insists that the preferential trading agreements the EU has negotiated with 60 third party countries will remain after Brexit. That position is either extremely naive, arrogant or deeply mendacious. Expert trade witnesses who appeared before the Europe Committee all that time ago uh, told us that the rollover of existing trading relationships was by no means certain. Dr. Matthias Margulis of the University of Stirling, for example, emphasised that what we are talking about in the short to medium term is a renegotiation of the market access that the UK currently enjoys, not additional trade deals. He thought that the process would take years, if not decades, just for the UK to achieve the market access that it currently enjoys. Well, presiding officer, two years on from those evidence sessions, our expert trade witnesses have been proven correct. Earlier this month, in response to a freedom of information request, the UK government confirmed that even at this late stage, it has no clear agreement to roll over any deals that third countries currently enjoy with the EU, and crucially, no set date for asking these countries whether they're willing to do so. We face a complete chaos even if a bad deal is clobbered together at the last minute. The clock is ticking, presiding officer. It's ticking for Scotland's exports to the EU and around the world. It's ticking for our NHS, which could be served up to private medical companies in a free trade deal with the US. You don't know what you've got to. It's gone, presiding officer. And as others have pointed out, the European Parliament does offer some protection against the most exploitative of trade deals. For example, the Parliament currently must sign off trade deals negotiated by the EU Commission and they have a robust scrutiny whereby individual MEPs are able to look at confidential trade documents which potentially impact on their constituents. During the TTIP negotiations with the USA, 14 separate committees of the European Parliament scrutinised in detail the proposed deal and as a result of this forensic scrutiny, TTIP was shelved. Who will perform that forensic scrutiny after Brexit? Without the protection of Europe and the European Parliament in particular, who can we trust? Well, the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey published this year found that 61% of people in Scotland trust the Scottish Government to work in Scotland's best interest compared to 20% for the UK Government. That is why it's absolutely crucial that this Parliament, every single member of it, gets a chance to scrutinise future trade deals and that the Scottish Government, which represents us, gets the chance to scrutinise the impact of those future trade deals on the citizens of Scotland. We are elected to protect our constituents and that includes protecting them against secret international deals which could destroy their livelihoods, their public services and even their health. Thank you very much. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Presiding officer, we are six months from the Brexit deadline of March next year, and we are not that much clearer about the manner of how the UK will leave the European Union, nor do we have a detailed model for trade policy to replace the structures of the European Union. The Chequers deal appears dead in the water, no matter what I think of it. The concluding summit in Salzburg last week, Donald Tusk said, bluntly that the economic aspect of May's checkers blueprint for Brexit will not work. We are only now beginning to realise the full range of implications of leaving the European Union and I have to see in the main it looks bleak to me. Trade arrangements of course are at the heart of any deal, the rules and agreements for business to operate across the world and they have major implications for domestic policy and it is probably a central issue for this parliament. But the trade bill as it currently stands is unacceptable in its current form and it should be unacceptable to most Democrats. The, the extensive use of ministerial power without justification leaves it an undemocratic piece of legislation and it is certainly not transparent, subject only to minimal scrutiny. We are asked to respect the result of the referendum. I cannot respect the way in which the UK government has chosen so far to take us out of Europe. There must be respect eh, on all sides. 
But the Brexit plan must give clarity and transparency to businesses, but it must also be transparent to elected members who are expected to scrutinise it on behalf of the general public who we represent. This bill is set to replace all the EU's existing trade agreements. So I believe there must be dialogue with all the devolved administrations. It is a new trade policy arrangement and it will impact on all of the parliaments. I believe, in fact, it would be against the interests of a United Kingdom, which I believe in, not to properly involve and include the nations and regions and assembly across this United Kingdom. For that reason, I want to address the Tory motion, which I think is way off the mark. It asks for this parliament to respect trade and international issues are reserved. But yet the UK government did not respect the previous debate we had about the withdrawal bill and the right for this parliament to have sovereignty over its devolved powers. Uh, there is nothing in the motion uh, which says that the Scottish Parliament should have a say even uh, in what should be distinctly Scottish interests that I thought we might even agree on. But it concerns me deeply. I certainly would not be arguing for a veto, but I think it's a totally undermining the devolution settlement and the United Kingdom if the Tories do not recognise that in the new arrangements it's really important to redefine what we mean being part of a United Kingdom and give this Parliament its say in the creation of the new trade agreements. Without that, it is very, very difficult to, to respect the outcome of a referendum where we've had virtually no say in the construction of these new arrangements. I think it's very hard for ordinary people to follow how this is playing out. According to the Times this week, Philip Hammond and Greg Clark called for businesses to be given more help to adapt to the new system of immigration. They argued against a cliff edge, and rightly so. I think that's the right argument to make. But they've lost the argument, it would appear. They're not backed by other remainers in the Cabinet, and they've simply stopped speaking up for many businesses who are deeply concerned about a new immigration policy which does not address their needs. It's no secret that Scotland has a rapidly ageing population and we have many industries which rely on a lower set of skills. The pensioner population is expected to rise by 20% over the next 25 years and that's in marked contrast to the working population. So there are differential characteristics of the Scottish nation which are not the same as the rest of the United Kingdom. This must be addressed in any future arrangement. So last week, the Home Office commissioned the Migration Advisory Committee report, which said that Scotland's economic situation is not sufficiently different to the rest of the UK to justify a different policy. This is simply not true. The proposals in the report suggest that blocking almost all workers coming to the UK with a new immigration system focused on attracting highly skilled staff. Um, Matthew Fell, CBI UK Policy Director, said the plans outlined for low-skilled workers and inadequate and risk-damaging labour shortages. I think this is quite an important point for our Tory colleagues to get across to the UK government. Jane Grattan, British Chamber of Commerce, said any sudden cut-off of the European economic area skills uh, uh, and labour would be concerning, if not disastrous, for firms across a wide range of regions and sectors. And Brian Berry, Chief Executive of the Federation of Master Builders, criticised the idea, suggesting they could devastate tens of thousands of small construction firms that rely on labourers from the EU. So there is a long way to go, I think, before a new immigration system is fit for purpose and fit for our own country. In my final 30 seconds, Presiding Officer, I just wanted to mention and declare my interest as a member of the GMB that the trade unions have had an important role in questioning what uh, industries might be uh, under threat. Uh, the Trade Remedies Authority just was set up under the Trade Bill. It has to deal with crucial sectors for the Scottish and the British economy. Steel and aluminium uh, are already subject to tariffs from the United States. Uh, and the same is true of ceramic and tableware, where high tariffs already have been announced. We do need a close relationship with EU trade policy. It's clear that the US will not give us preferential treatment. And there you areas. must conclude. I'm so and sorry, there's not a second in hand. Um, I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, Planning Officer. Planning Officer, Scotland actually wants to be a constructive partner to the other UK nations, to, uh, sorry, other nations of the UK, and also a constructive and fair trading partner to the countries around the world. And the UK uh, government's approach so far must change, it seems, to place the interests and the involvement of the devolved nations 
uh, on a par with sectoral interests. And the UK government has also talked about the trade deals that work for the whole of the UK. But Scotland, Wales and also Northern Ireland could, in some negotiations, have very different interests from the rest of the UK. And uh, these differences would be best addressed before uh, reaching the negotiation table. Uh, the, the way that trade arrangements are developed within the UK cannot simply remain the same. Now, the development, the conduct and also the content of future trade policy and agreements will therefore have important implications for Scotland and the future trade agreements it will almost certainly involve devolved issues. I'm saying also for these reasons I've just, that I've just outlined, it's clear that this chamber needs to send the strongest message possible to the UK government that there needs to be a guaranteed role in the development of trade agreements for the Scottish government, but also this parliament, which would benefit the Scottish producers, exporters, consumers, and also our constituents and our communities. It's also clear that the, the best future for Scotland and the UK is to remain in the European Union, or at the very least in the single market and customs union. But we must do everything that we possibly can to protect Scotland's interests in future trade deals and in all possible outcomes. It's also clear that the Scottish Government still have significant concerns about some aspects of the UK Trade Bill and they'll continue to actually work to have the bill amended. And uh, we've already uh, heard today some uh, quotes from the UK Trade Minister, George Hollenbury, when uh, he took part in a session at the Finance and Constitution Committee. But he also spoke in the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And in that committee, uh, he stated, uh, we are absolutely clear that there should be deep and meaningful consultation with the Scottish Government and that we should be open to modifying our proposals on the basis of the information that we receive. I am absolutely committed to that. He also continued by saying, it seems to me that we will get much improved and much more deliverable free trade agreements if we can all agree on exactly what they should end up proposing and how we should negotiate them. And the fine detail uh, of what forum that mechanism will take is yet to be resolved, but I give the committee a political commitment that I believe that it is absolutely right that the devolved administrations should have a real input. Now, uh, Mr. Hollingbury also stated uh, that day that uh, I'm absolutely determined, uh, <coughs> as is the Secretary of State, that the consultations that we hold will be meaningful, wide and deep. We will take into account the interests of all interested parties, which certainly includes the devolved authorities. We are not yet set on exactly how we will involve the, the devolved authorities. Now, that tells me uh, a few different things, presiding officer. First of all, that, uh, that here is a, a UK minister uh, who actually understands one aspect of this, and that's it's not about a veto that, uh, that we heard earlier on from Mr. Tompkins. It's actually about having an agreement with the devolved administrations. I mean, and and I'll, I'll read this point again just for Mr. Tompkins' record. I don't know if he, if he, he looked at this particular part of the official report. And it's this bit, he says, if we can all agree on exactly what they should end up proposing and on how we should negotiate them. That is not a veto. That's about two governments actually working together to try to get the best possible outcome. <coughs> Saying also, I've, I've never heard, nor I, not, not, sorry, never ever expect any Scottish government minister to claim that everything that they propose to the UK government should be listened to. However, a UK government rife with internal division should attempt to work with the devolved administrations. The Scottish government has been willing to negotiate, discuss and have meaningful dialogue with the, UK government for the, last, with the UK government for the last two years. And as the Minister stated earlier, the UK government have talked a good game, but clearly their actions have been somewhat different. Now, President Officer, today we've heard, uh, I've heard a lot, uh, once again, about the aspects uh, of, uh, of previous uh, kind of, uh, trade um, negotiations, we heard about TTIP. We've also heard about uh, the issue of the chlorinated chicken, the selling off of the NHS to the highest bidder, uh, reduced food standards, the power grab, and also other negative aspects about this, uh, this situation that we face. Therefore, bearing in mind that we've actually had trade arrangements via the EU for the last 40 years, and going forward, any future trade arrangements will clearly have an effect upon Scotland and also our economy, and also devolved issues, then surely a common sense approach uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> common sense approach would have been for the UK government to genuinely, genuinely work with the devolved administrations and parliaments to actually have a stronger negotiating position when it comes to future trade negotiations. Now, the UK wrecking ball approach needs to stop and a reboot of the intergovernmental arrangements, as Tavi Scott spoke about in his comments, it needs to happen to build the trust and also the common ground to take forward international trade discussions. If the UK government doesn't, then our constituents, our communities, our economy will not be in a beneficial position. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr McMillan. I call Gordon Lindhurst to follow by Angela Constance. Mr Lindhurst, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, on the quay at Leith is a 19th century painting depicting the important role the port once played as the main trading route in and out of Scotland. Including the exportation of bottles, one million a week from the Leith Glassworks at its peak in 1770, uh, according to figures that I've received. I've not either researched them nor was I around at the time to verify them. But the picture is a hive of activity with ships being loaded and waiting to sail across the world. Indeed, until the building of the Kiel Canal in 1895, there was regular direct trade for centuries between the Baltic Sea and Scotland, the Baltic coast and islands, including in Scottish Herring, by one of my own ancestors. Fast forward to today, Leith may have dramatically changed, but the importance of building and maintaining trading relationships has not. And Scotland now has a fantastic opportunity to play a key role in a more ambitious UK trade policy as we leave the EU. We are an outward looking country with a distinct culture, providing products and services desired around the globe. The beauty of the sort of open and free trade that the UK has always been in the driving seat for as a member of the EU, where our businesses get the chance to export and show off their products around the world. But more than this, our consumers are offered a wider range of products at more competitive prices, where jobs can be created as a result of investment into this country. We look forward to much more of this in the coming years. On paper, of course, the EU negotiating position is formidable. 500 million citizens, one market. However, with 28 different member states having their own interests, negotiations can be made very cumbersome indeed. Just ask the Canadian government, which struggled on for seven long years before the EU eventually agreed to a deal that has now provisionally been in place for one year. Only for Italy's new government this summer to threaten not to ratify it, enough to bring the deal crashing down around all member states. Instead, Scotland's voice will be stronger as part of a more agile United Kingdom of closely aligned economies that can mold trading relationships around interests closer to home. Part of a, certainly. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. While he argues that the UK might get a better trade deal, would he accept that there's at least a risk that the UK will get a poorer trade deal than the EU can manage? Gordon Lindhurst. Well, what we will have as a result of leaving the EU is the ability to have a more ambitious trade drive. And we've already made our intention clear. So it will free us up to negotiate proper deals. Con consultations are already underway, which give all Scots the chance to comment on what they want to see from proposed deals with the USA, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific countries. These are the sorts of opportunities we've not had for some 40 years now as a result of being locked into the EU. And although the Scotland Act 1998 categorizes international trade as a reserve matter, Scottish government officials regularly engage with UK trade department officials. They can offer devolved expertise on a range of issues, and this can be valued by the UK government and found valuable in its own positioning. It can be hugely important in light of the potential negotiations in front of us with vast untapped potential for broadening our horizons. Not least because the IMF predicts 90% of growth in the next 10 years will be outside the EU. And there are significant gaps where the EU has failed to deliver free trade and investment deals. For example, the lack of a comprehensive trade deal with India with its 
1.3 billion people and marketplace. Not at the minute, please. I'm seeking to make, seeking to make progress. Turning to India, it's 1.3 billion marketplace with which the EU has failed to make a comprehensive deal is exemplified in some of the export statistics. Scottish exports to India sit at only 235 million pounds compared to exports to the small country of Luxembourg of 370 million pounds. That tells us there is much, much more to be done on the world stage. Negotiating trade and investment deals after Brexit could therefore be a game-changing opportunity for international exports, as the chief executive of Scotland Food and Drink has said recently. But as well as looking to the future, more can be done now, as the Economy Committee in this Parliament found recently. Internationalisation is one of the government's four key priorities, as set out in its 2015 economic strategy. And yet the same report found that Scotland needs 5,000 more companies to start exporting before it can move into the OECD upper quartile. SDI's own evaluation of international activities noted improvement in Scotland's trade performance, but a shortage of exporting firms compared to other parts of the UK. Our committee report summarised that while the theory and principles of Scotland's trade and investment strategy are sound, it lacks government commitment and financial backing. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP may like to talk about constitutional minutiae, but it should instead concentrate on how Scotland can give that commitment to helping businesses export while working with others to make us the great trading nation we know we can be. Thank you. I call Angela Constance to be followed by Neil Bibby. Ms Constance, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the point has been made repeatedly throughout today's debate that trade agreements are not just about how many goods at what price. Uh, in today's world, trade agreements reach far and wide. They encroach on public policy and impact deeply uh, on our day-to-day -day lives, cutting across uh, both reserved and devolved competencies. And if we believe in inclusive growth that values fairness and competitiveness, uh, recognising that growing our economy and addressing inequality are not mutually exclusive, but two sides of the same coin, then the calls for a, an ethical, transparent and democratic framework to scrutinise and agree future trade agreements uh, should be heeded and indeed are timely. And if we believe in a, a modern participative democracy, uh, now is the time to be clear about how the UK government and the Scottish government and other devolved administrations uh, work meaningfully uh, in partnership uh, to both pursue and protect our collective and individual interest. Because like it or not, the, the world around us is changing. And the Scottish government discussion paper is quite simply just making the case that we need now uh, to have better arrangements uh, within the UK to pursue uh, those interests. And we all know what is reserved and what is devolved. It is indeed uh, written in black and white. However, life, unlike the, the print on pages of a, a law book, life isn't two-dimensional. Making decisions isn't a two-dimensional process. And what I know from experience is that two sets of ministers in two different governments reading out a list of what is reserved and what is devolved doesn't get us very far and actually delivers nothing for citizens. In the real world, reserved and devolved powers interact with each other and sometimes in competing ways. And now, while I have a, a simple solution to that conundrum, eh, I will, of course, stick eh, to the terms of today's debate. And I was really struck by the, the findings of the House of Commons uh, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee when they said in July of this year, we are concerned that so much work still needs to be done 20 years on from the establishment of devolution in 1998. It is clear from the evidence of, to this inquiry that Whitehall uh, operates on the basis of a structure uh, and a culture which takes little account of the realities of devolution in the UK and that this is inimical uh, to the principles of devolution and good governance. 
of the UK. So what that actually says to me, Presider Officer, is that it's in everyone's interest uh, for Whitehall to get with the, the devolution programme and that the biggest barrier, as I see it, is that the UK government still doesn't really get devolution and you need to understand devolution uh, to respect it. And I wasn't a member of the Finance and Constitution Committee uh, when George Hollingberry, the UK's uh, Minister of Trade uh, for Trade, Minister of State for Trade Policy, gave evidence a few weeks ago. Uh, but I did uh, read his evidence uh, with great interest, and I found some of his uh, language uh, illuminating. And I suppose, as an aside, I was rather wickedly amused that Mr Hollingbury got Mr McKee and Mr Mackay mixed up, as I thought that only happened to, to women. Uh, and there were lots of uh, warm words uh, about the, the commitment to engage, but uh, precious little on the detail other than references that were made to uh, current engagement at official level where Scottish Government officials uh, share their views and expertise, I quote upstream, an interesting word. Uh, there were deep dives on technical matters, the role of Scotland's 59 MPs and Territorial Secretary of State's uh, was discussed as well, but all of that uh, is, is, is a given and it was a poor deflection from the need to change how we currently work. And when Willie Coffey asked the Minister to give an example of how uh, a devolved administration had shaped uh, policy, uh, the answer from a civil servant was, well, I'm sure that we could find some such example without actually identifying one. So what is needed, presiding officer, is a, a respectful and mature process where devolved administrations can be guaranteed a, a meaningful role in policy formation, negotiation, agreement and implementation. And there are very clear arguments why this is in the interest uh, of the UK as a whole as well as Scotland, respecting both what we have in common but also our different needs. And we've heard from uh, Joan McAlpine that the British and Scottish Chamber of Commerce, the CBI, Federation of Small Businesses, support the involvement of devolved administrations in matters such as mandate preparation, oversight and approval. And the Minister has outlined today a desire to be a constructive partner uh, and we need a structure, a system, whether that's an intergovernmental committee uh, or other arrangement that actually enables uh, different spheres of government to move on and to be able to work together on the substantive issues of the day as opposed to constantly fighting uh, about processes. And I have to say, presiding officer, the issue of trust and integrity are of central importance too and it is utterly uh, unbecoming of Theresa May who is whether I like it or not and I don't like it the Prime Minister of the entire UK it is utterly despicable for her to be briefing against Scotland uh, and the Scottish Government uh, when she is uh, in Europe. So uh, to uh, conclude uh, presiding officer there are indeed many uh, international examples to to learn from uh, but many of the countries that we seek to learn from do indeed have different arrangements. They have different constitutional uh, arrangements and quite often have uh, written constitutions. And what I'm clear about is that uh, while you can't cherry pick uh, or shift and lift carte blanche uh, from other countries, we can certainly really look and apply learning uh, from others and adapt it uh, to our own experience, uh, guided, of course, by very clear principles no, you must conclude. Uh, and Sorry. transparency. And now's the time to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I call Neil Bibby to be followed by John Mason. Mr Bibby, please. Thank you, President Officer. As we know, trade agreements are the rules which govern our economic relationships with the rest of the world. For over 40 years, those rules have been shaped by our place in Europe. And for over 40 years, as a willing member state, we have ourselves shaped those rules in Europe. Exiting the European Union will inevitably change our relationship with the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. The extent of that change, however, remains unclear because even now, with six months to go until exit day, no agreement has been reached on a Brexit deal or the rules that would then come in to govern our relationship with the EU. As Jackie Bailey said, the Prime Minister's Chequers deal is dead. The Cabinet has been in open revolt and no deal is looking more and more likely. However, the Scottish Government motion today is not about the wisdom of leaving the EU or the options which will have to be decided upon. It is, I believe, about trying to build something constructive when it comes to international trade agreements. And this surely is something on which we can all agree across the chamber. I welcome both the tone and the content of the motion. Presiding officer, the intention of the UK government is to negotiate a series of bilateral deals from March 2019 onwards. 
But until we know the nature of the UK's relationship with the EU going forward, we will not know the extent to which there can actually be an independent UK trade policy post-Brexit. And we will not know the full impact it will have on the economy. The Scottish Government's publication on future UK trade arrangements sets out in detail the significance of trade to the UK and to Scotland. Paragraph 23 of the report spells out in sobering terms just what leaving the single market and customs union could mean. A WTO rule scenario leading to a loss of 8.5% GDP in Scotland by 2030. A free trade agreement relationship leading to GDP being 6.1% lower by 2030. For all these reasons, the Brexit deal matters. We need to get it right, but we should also be prepared for all eventualities. Promising a transparent and inclusive independent trade policy back in July, the International Trade uh, Secretary, Liam Fox, said to develop and deliver a UK trade policy that benefits business workers and consumers across the whole of the UK, we need to reflect the needs and individual circumstances of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. For Labour, one of our six tests for any Brexit deal is with the, the, the government come forward with is does it deliver for all the nations and regions of the UK? And, President Officer, uh, like Polly McNeill, I believe we must apply that same test to any future trade agreements we sign up to post Brexit. Currently, as we know, all of the UK's international trade deals are negotiated through the EU. But as the report points out, losing the EU's negotiating power, scrutiny and expertise will require a massive step change in the way the UK conducts its affairs in relation to international matters. And I know that Jackie Bailey and others have, 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 have said that that is a key challenge before all of us. For decision makers, for trade negotiators, for regulators, for governments and leaders across party lines. To achieve a massive ch step change while ensuring that any trade arrangements are transparent, inclusive and meet the needs of the nations and regions of the UK. Brexit is testing political conventions and orthodoxies in this country to destruction. It's time for new ways of thinking and new ways of working to emerge. A new mindset about how the governments of these islands work together. It requires goodwill and cooperation. It challenges us to learn from good practice elsewhere, as well as introducing new innov innovative practices of our own. In evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee in April, Kathleen Walker Shaw of the GMB, and I declare I'm a member of the GMB, outlined concerns. She said about existing global and EU level trade agreements predominantly because of their lack of democracy, transparency and inclusiveness of stakeholders. We can better engage with stakeholders by giving our devolved parlance a meaningful say by the UK government accepting that devolved administrations are not their competitors or opponents, but partners in an endeavour the like of which none of us have ever had to engage with before. To do that, we need to have a formal structure, we need clear and binding agreements, we need mutual respect and understanding, and we need parity of esteem. As Kathleen Walker-Shore also said, that means that the Scottish Parliament and other devolved administrations must have a formal and substantial say on why we are having any trade agreement, what its aims and objectives and scopes are, and what its mandate is. And as Bruce Crawford said earlier, the Finance Constitution Committee uh, members have been taking uh, evidence when it comes to trade, and I agree with him. It has been useful for us to hear the experience of officials and representatives of different countries. What struck me is that other countries, especially those with federal or devolved structures, deliver complex trade deals acceptable to their nations and regions when they have a robust agreed process underpinned by a genuine spirit of cooperation. That could mean central government and devolved government agreeing a common negotiation position before entering formal trade talks. That could mean observer status for devolved administrations. That could even mean proper recognition for local government as a sphere of government, not just a tier with a significant interest in our future trading relationships. There are no easy answers. What works well in one agreement with one country will not necessarily work well with others, and I know members have said that. But surely a new framework of cooperation and understanding is a sound and legitimate basis on which to proceed. Governments and devolved administrations won't always get everything they want. Kathleen Walker Shaw again pointed out in relation to the Canadian provinces. I know that whether the, provin whether, whether the provinces were able to get where they wanted to be on CETA is an open question. A lot of compromises were made. There is no perfect model. But even if we don't always get what we want, let's put in place the framework that allows us to try. Let's make a complex process more transparent, more inclusive, and let's make sure it reflects the needs of our economy. President officer, we are entering into uncharted and turbulent waters. I hope the UK government responds positively to the motion tabled by the Scottish Government. Thank you very much.
I call John Mason to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr Mason, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I have to say I have become increasingly pessimistic as I prepared for this speech and looked through the discussion paper, which goes through various scenarios. But given the mood music, fro the mood music from Westminster, it is not a very hopeful picture. To start with some general comments, I certainly do feel that I can trust the European Union more than I can trust the UK. The EU has ideals, but it can also be very pragmatic. While Westminster does not seem to have very much in the way of ideals, nor does it seem to be living in the real practical world. The EU has negotiating power, scrutiny, expertise, and the fear is that the UK has none of these. The UK has been behaving like a spoilt brat. The Chequers Agreement was meant to be an opening offer for negotiations, not a take it or leave it final offer. It should have come much earlier in the process. There is probably a majority in the House of Commons for a soft Brexit, keeping us in the single market and the customs union. But it does seem that both Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn are putting their parties before the country rather than standing up to the ardent Brexiteers in both parties. Labour seem to be saying that we need a federal system. Now, I seem to remember that Gordon Brown said that quite a while ago, but that would require a written constitution for the whole of the UK. Can we really expect that anytime soon, even if Labour were to win a Westminster election? However, a federal system could be an improvement as it would make it much clearer who had the power to do what, whereas devolution always leaves the real power at the centre. I have to say also that I, part of me does feel sorry for Theresa May. She just cannot possibly square all the circles that she finds herself in. On the discussion paper itself, eh, I thought there was a lot of good material. In the introduction on page 10, paragraphs 10 and 11, it makes the very useful point of how much we need to increase trade with other countries to compensate if we lose trade with the EU. For example, we would need to triple services, services trade with China, but that would still not equal one-fifth of the UK's current services exports to the single market. In chapter one, it talks about some of the key differences between Scotland and the UK as far as trade is concerned. Page 17, chart three, makes the point that food and drink is much more important to Scotland. And the fear has to be that UK negotiators will be less concerned about sectors which are relatively important to Scotland, but relatively unimportant to the UK. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier to Murdo Fraser. On page 18, tables two and three, uh, paragraph 36 talks about how 92,000 tonnes of salmon worth 600 million pounds are exported from the UK each year, and 99% of that is from Scotland. How seriously will the UK negotiators take that very, very important sector? And again, on uh, page 19, paragraph 38, it talks about the differences between the service sectors, where, for example, if you look at professional, scientific, technical, and real estate, they are much more important relatively to Scotland, at 45% of our se service sector, whereas they are only 30% of the UK's. So the fear has to be that when negotiations take place with the EU, EU or with other countries, if there are no checks on the UK negotiators, they will inevitably do what they think is best for the biggest part, that is England and potentially the southeast of England, whereas Northern Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, Cumbria, let alone Scotland, will scarcely be on the radar. This chapter concludes by looking at imports, and argues that global production chains can mean products and their components crossing multiple borders. So tariffs can become burdensome for both producers and consumers. However, I do accept that there is a challenge in getting a right balance in this. Under EU, EU regulation, it does seem that we've been largely unable to favor local suppliers over cheaper imports. And many of us have not always been comfortable with this. Fair trade, for example, has been allowed, and that has effectively enabled Scottish, UK, and EU consumers to choose to pay a premium to ensure farmers and others in the developing world get paid a decent wage. And there, I specifically would disagree with what Adam Tompkins was arguing, because sometimes free trade does drive down wages in the developing world. Now, this model, for example, like fair trade, is a model I would like to see developed so that not only individuals, but a local authority or a whole country can choose to only allow imports that meet certain human rights or perhaps animal welfare standards. 
The hope would be that such possibilities could be built into future ag trade agreements even better than the EU has managed, and that is what the Conservatives seem to be arguing. But the fear has to be that the UK will be smaller and weaker than the EU and will fail even to achieve the present standards. I do thank the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition for their briefing. I certainly agree with a number of the principles laid out there. For example, that trade should be based on ethical principles. But I would just caution against being too idealistic and cutting off our noses despite our faces. I fear that if we only dealt with countries and companies which were above reproach, we would not be doing very much trade at all. Again, there has to be a reasonable balance. And finally, in the report uh, in paragraph 56, it talks about the length of time for trade deals. The quickest that the EU has managed is three years. So the question is, how long will the UK take? So in conclusion, the ball is very much in the UK government's court. They have taken far too long to get to where we are, but they must be willing to negotiate, not just make demands of the EU, as we would expect from a colonial power. And finally, I would appear to the London leaderships of the Tories to please consider what is best for the country, not just who will win the next election. Thank, thank, you. thank you. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Willie Coffey. And I thank you both. You've both had your speeches cut to five minutes each to allow the, the uh, debate to go on properly. So Rachel Hamilton followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, for more than 40 years, the negotiation of trade agreements has been the exclusive competence of the EU. We know that when we exit the EU, we will have far more involvement in our future UK trade agreements than we would currently. As my colleagues have mentioned, our amendment seeks to amend the motion, the motion to highlight the significance of cooperation and collaboration between all parts of the UK as we move forward with Brexit. The UK Government has repeatedly committed to working closely with Scotland to deliver a future trade policy which works for the whole of the United Kingdom. Yet the SNP continue to sound aggrieved about this and won't work collaboratively with the UK Government to help forge those future trade deals in order that we can reach the best outcome for Scotland and the rest of the UK. Our amendment is unequivocal. We are calling on all parliaments, assemblies and governments in the UK to ensure that the UK's withdrawal from the EU is delivered compatibly with the UK's devolution arrangements, respecting both that which is devolved and that which is reserved. I'll take a short intervention if you don't mind. John McAlpine. Says the UK government is so focused on securing uh, trade deals. Why hasn't the UK gov government set a date for uh, agreeing the rollover of current preferential trade agreements uh, that the EU has negotiated Rachel on Hamilton. the UK's behalf? Rachel Hamilton. Uh, I thank Jeremy Campbell for that intervention. I mean, what, what we need to focus on here is the engagement process of the consultation and the process that takes us forward with the free trade agreements, which actually involves Scotland and the other devolved administrations. Any future trade deal will have massive potential for Scotland, we believe. The Fraser Valander Institute has already stated that Brexit, and I quote, will encourage companies to consider trade on a much more international scale and over a longer time frame. The opportunity to take Scotland global and really showcase our products abroad could be positive for our economy. Presiding officer, at the moment, Scotland exports 370 million to Luxembourg, but just 235 million to India, and we trade 80% more with Ireland than we do with China. Only three of the top countries in the world by size of population appear in the top 20 of Scotland's exports. I, I see that Mike Russell is putting his hands in his head. I, I think that there's a huge potential, and clearly the, that Mike Russell cannot see this. Going forward with Brexit, we do have the chance to change this, and I just wish that Mike Russell was slightly more opt optimistic for Scotland. Scotland punches well above its weight in producing many fine quality products, for example. Take food and drink, mentioned by many others today. The IMF predicts that 90% of growth in the next five years will be outside of the EU. James Withers has been quoted today of Scotland's food and drink. He said that this is a major opportunity. Martin Bell, Deputy Director of Trade at the Scottish Whisky Association, welcomed Scotland's future trade possibilities. He said, and I quote, the Scotch whisky industry welcomes the opportunity to share our priorities for future UK trade negotiations with these key trading partners. Many Scottish companies do not currently export internationally due to perhaps a lack of finance, awareness of opportunities and international savvy. This is despite many companies trading with England and other parts of the UK, which already require packaging and logistics. 
Shankar Singram, Director of the International Trade and Competition Unit at Free Trade Think Tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs, said that the UK's narrower range of offensive interests made it more likely to succeed where the EU had failed to negotiate access for Scotch in growth markets. I'm sorry, I'm uh, limited time. My time's been cut. I'm sorry, Mr McKee. I believe both the Scottish and UK governments have a vital role to play in ensuring that companies have the necessary tools to promote their products for export. The role of government is therefore not only to provide financial support, but also to increase awareness of that support that's already available, as well as providing easily accessible advice on internationalisation. The UK government's made it clear that as we leave the EU, our high standards for consumers, employees and the environment, and in particular animal welfare, will be maintained. Healthcare and food standards will not be compromised in future trade deals. And we've heard George Hollenbury being quoted today, but he said the UK is absolutely clear that we will not be dropping our phytosanitary or food standards. And, and these are things that will not be negotiating away in freed trade deals. Let me be clear, presiding officer, Mr. Hollenbury went on to say the UK will not be signing agreements that allow the National Health Service to be challenged by foreign investors. Similarly, any food issues can be dealt with in such agreements, and we have made clear commitments about how we will deal with such issues. To conclude, presiding officer, we must never forget that Scotland's export nearly four times as much to the UK as it does to the EU, a fact that members sitting on the other side of the chamber show complete regard to, disregard to. Thank you. No, sorry, oh, must you. conclude. And I call Willie Coffey, and then we move to closing speeches. Mr Coffey, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. When I visited Brussels last week, last week with colleagues from the Finance Committee, the one thing I learned from the visit was this, that our colleagues in Europe, whether it was the German lender or the Swiss cantons, they embraced a process where their federal governments fully involved all their devolved administrations and only proceeded in matters when agreement was reached. The lender themselves have full responsibility for education and cultural policy, and the federal government has to get consent from the lender in certain matters Otherwise, they cannot proceed. We met representatives, representatives from three of the lender, from Bavaria, the biggest, from Thuringia, one of the smallest, and from Brandenburg in the former East Germany. Despite the clear differences in size and scale and the challenges that were faced by Germany when the East came into the EU overnight in 1990, the common thread that holds it all together was their basic law and the Lindau Agreement. That is, if international treaties contain any provisions that affect state competencies, then the federal government has to obtain the consent of the lender. And in return, the lender can actually conclude treaties with foreign states with the consent of the federal government. Now, that system has been in place for many years now, and it has served Germany particularly well. Um, I can remember the surprise in the Swiss ambassador to the EU, Mr. Bucher's face, when we asked him how disputes were resolved and both he and his colleagues looked at one another and said, we don't have any, <laughs> because they engage in detailed discussion with colleagues and all interested parties, including public, holding public referenda from time to time. The Swiss cantons all retain a high degree of autonomy. They enjoy fiscal autonomy, have their own constitutions and control everything that is not specifically reserved to the Federation for example, in healthcare, education and domestic security. The division of responsibility between the cantons and the federal state is respected and it can't be overturned by central government interference. The point of all of this, presiding officers, is that these countries work hard at getting agreement in advance and they benefit from it as a result by avoiding disputes and talk about vetoes. Contrast this approach with the position here in Scotland. Our government, our parliament and citizens are not to be part of the process. No real engagement or participation, no scrutiny, and we are to have no right to reject any proposal that might cut across our own responsibilities. We asked Mr Hollingbury, the Trade Minister, if his government was planning to include anyone from the devolved administrations on his new Trade Remedies Authority that will try to resolve issues that may arise, and the answer was basically no. So we could have the situation where this body is dealing with issues that clearly cut across the devolved powers of all of the parliaments and assemblies, yet there may well be no one serving on the authority with any knowledge of the devolved powers at all. Any trade agreements must surely be supported 
by all of the devolved administrations to and not simply be foisted on us. Colleagues have described some of the possible scenarios that could happen in relation to our prized Scottish produce, like Scottish beef and salmon, not to mention whisky, and even one of my local products in Ayrshire, the wonderful Dunlop cheese, which enjoys PGI, or predicted geographical indication status. The strength of the European Union in protect, protecting our PGI products, and even our NHS, should not be underestimated. Any trade deal that the UK enters into must never diminish or trade away the protected status of our brands simply to get any deal that it seeks. Scotland must have a clear role to play in the process and the UK government, rather than opposing this at every step of the way, should rethink their position and embrace an approach that fully involves the devolved administrations. They have to trust us and we have to trust them in order to get the best deal all around. And I think that was really the point that Bruce Crawford was making earlier in his speech. But that will only come about if the UK agrees to the same level of involvement for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that we see across Europe and which was explained and illustrated to us so graphically last week while we were in Brussels. So, presiding officer, the UK government seems to want to be the boss here and we are to take whatever they want to dish out because trade is reserved and that's that. That arrogance flies in the face of the approach taken in Europe that I've just described and it's a recipe for another disaster, as if we needed one on top of the Brexit chaos we're currently in. Those in charge of the UK really need to move into the 21st century and stop behaving like colonial governors that they once were. Surely we can move forward and embrace some of the modern thinking that we've experienced in Europe last week to make sure that trade agreements are in all of our nation's best interests. Thank you. Thank you. I move to closing speeches. I call James Kelly to close for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think in terms of this afternoon's debate, there, there have been sort of three important themes as far as I'm concerned. Uh, trade, the role of devolved uh, institutions and dispute resolution. Um, I think right at the outset, the, the importance of trade and our trading relationship with the EU uh, remains absolutely critical, you know, even post-Brexit. We trade £12 billion uh, to the rest of the EU. Um, and the, the, the disaster of Brexit, the impact of that, uh, has got real drastic consequences for the country. I mean, how Adam Tompkins can talk about, uh, you know, the importance of economic growth and supporting economic growth when the prospect of a no-deal Brexit will mean that, you know, we don't have consistent rules and regulations and policies with the rest of the EU, and that will undermine some of that £12 billion trading block, and therefore uh, it will cut economic growth, and that will affect, under the new budget arrangements, that will affect the tax uh, coming into the, the country, and ultimately result in public spending cuts. Um, Jackie Bailey was right to point out that the, the, the Tories are in tatters over this. They seem to have spent um, most of the time since June 2016 trying to put together an agreement that will bring together the Tory party uh, without any respect to what the rest of the 27 EU countries think uh, and are then, are then surprised when the EU uh, don't agree that their first cut of it. Um, in terms of the trade bill, I think Pauline McNeill was right to point out that the way it's drafted currently uh, the powers are restrictive in terms of the involvement of devolved institutions and therefore you could end up with a, uh, a lack of scrutiny uh, around uh, trade deals, deals been done behind closed doors and that's not good for the overall prospect of the deals and it's not good for the involvement of uh, devolved institutions. What's required, as Neil Bibby pointed out, are uh, transparent and inclusive arrangements uh, if we're going to get proper and robust trade deals that will actually make a contribution to the Scottish and UK economies. In terms of the, ro the role of devolved uh, uh, institutions, you know, Patrick Harvey was right to emphasise the importance of uh, a proper process, uh, one that sets out clear rules and mechanisms. And I think within that, it's important that 
devolved institutions have the ability to or in order to negotiate variations from the, the UK trade deals where, where they're appropriate uh, for uh, public institutions you know, within Scotland and other devolved institutions. Uh, if you take the living wage as an example, uh, there are over 400,000 people in Scotland who aren't paid the real living wage. Uh, in a previous parliament, I attempted to mandate that uh, public bodies would have to pay the living wage and it was voted down by the SNP on the basis that uh, wrongly I felt it was against EU law. So under, the, under new trade arrangements post-Brexit, there will be the opportunity uh, to fix that problem uh, if the, the ability is built in there for uh, devolved institutions to derogate on issues like the living wage where the trade agreement affects public bodies. So I think that's a, an important aspect. I think the, the, the other point that came out in the debate was how to re resolve disputes. Um, I thought Tavi Scott made some vital points on this. I regret the fact that the Lib Dems weren't able to put forward uh, their motion. Um, I think the, the way forward um, is not for you know, the House of Commons or the Scottish Parliament to have the power of veto. Uh, I mean, in that regard, I thought that Bruce Crawford made a really substantive contribution reflecting on the Finance and Constitution Committee's uh, trip to, to Brussels last week. And one of the lessons a number of members uh, reflected this. Yes, yeah, sure, Stuart. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank James Kelly for taking the intervention, but I'm sure Mr Kelly will agree with me that this issue of intergovernmental relations has been long-standing, and it's not just something that's happened because of Brexit. James Kelly. No, uh, clearly the importance of intergovernmental inter relations is, uh, is absolutely vital. But as I was going on to say, what, uh, what we learned from last week's tra trip to Brussels is the importance of uh, cooperation, the importance of clear rules and a mechanism of discussions at an early stage, and ultimately about uh, all parties um, seeking to try and, and reach a consensus or reach an agreement, even if they start out, start out in a place of disagreement. And from that point of view, you know, there's a lesson from all, for all of us. You can't have a situation where the UK government are, you know, uh, <coughs> are simply shouting down the Scottish government, trying to put the Scottish government in its place. And equally, the Scottish government needs to move on to a footing where they're prepared to work uh, and make a, a, an arrangement if it's feasible with the UK government. I think that's what's got to be reflected on. The way forward, presiding officer, is clear rules, agreement, uh, and seeking, seeking consensus. Thank you very much. I call on Dean Lockhart. Closed we can serve to six minutes, Mr Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we've heard a number of uh, concerns expressed by members across the Chamber this afternoon about the future prospects for Scotland's trade. I rarely find myself to be on the optimistic side of a debate, but I would like to address some of the concerns raised by having a look at Scotland's current trading position. 61% of our trade is with the rest of the UK. 17% is with the EU single market. In fact, the value of our exports to the EU have declined since 2010. Meanwhile, our exports to the rest of the world have been increasing in recent years and now represents 23% of our trade. Given, given that 90% of the future world economic growth in the next 10 years is going to be outside of Europe, it's vital that we help Scottish business gain, gain further access to these fast-growing markets. To explore how we can take advantage of these trading opportunities, I want to briefly deal with continuity of trading arrangements before moving on to future trading agreements. At the moment, more than 5% of our total trade is governed by existing EU free trade agreements with third countries. One of the key objectives of the UK trade bill is therefore to roll over these existing EU deals as smoothly and as quickly as possible. And to address some of the concerns that James Kelly raised, the UK Minister for Trade Policy, George Hollingbury, made it clear in his evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee that we must ensure that these trade agreements continue to be in place on the day we leave the EU. The intention is to alter these trading arrangements as little as possible, and continuity is all about giving certainty to business, consumers, and our trading partners. Speed will be of the essence. 
My colleagues have made it clear today that the proposals contained in the SNP's trade paper would undermine these objectives. Requiring the agreement of the Scottish Government, I will in a second, requiring the agreement of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament for the rollover of existing EU trade deals is not only incompatible with a devolution settlement, but it would delay the process. It would defeat the commercial necessity for continuity, certainty and speed in rolling over these existing trade deals. I'll give way to the Minister. I have Mickey. Does the member expect that we're going to roll these deals, or the UK government's going to roll these deals over? We're heading towards an audio Brexit. Dean Lockhart. The, these deals will, the UK will replace the EU with the third countries using the existing trade agreements in place. So that, that, would, be, that would be the way that would work. Yes, it would. Now, I now want to turn to how future trading agreements will be negotiated, agreed and implemented. A number of members, including Gordon Lindhurst, Rachel Hamilton, highlighted that withdrawing from the EU will give us the opportunity to shape our own trade opportunities and expand our trade with some of the fastest growing economies in the world, including China and India. Our current exports to these markets are marginal. For example, less than 2% of our exports go to China and less than 1% go to India. But when it comes to the question of how Scotland should approach future free trade agreements, the countless policy papers issued by the SNP have painted a confusing picture. On the one hand, in the trade paper we are debating today, the SNP argues that the specific needs of Scotland's economy must be fully reflected in future deals negotiated by the UK government. And for this reason, it is proposing a veto at every stage of the preparation, negotiation and ratification of any UK free trade agreement. Yeah. But on the other hand, the, SNP, the SNP's policy of a differentiated approach to Europe of remaining in the single market would hand significant powers over future trade agreements back to Brussels. Yeah. This would mean that all future trade agreements for Scotland would have to reflect the widely conflicting interests of 27 other EU member states. With the specific needs of Scotland's economy being marginalised and diluted and with no veto rights for the Scottish Government or this Parliament. Presiding officer, the SNP's position in relation to Scotland's future trading arrangements is contradictory, confusing and lacks credibility. Our approach is to get the best future trade deals for Scotland as an integ integral part of the UK economy. Murdo Fraser made the point, the needs, I, I need to make progress, the needs of Scotland's key economic sectors are closely aligned with the rest of the UK, whether it's financial services in Edinburgh and London, manufacturing in Glasgow and the Midlands, or fisheries in the North East and Cornwall, the needs of the Scottish economy are closely aligned. And the best way to achieve this is for the Scottish Government to work closely with the UK Government to ensure Scotland's interests are reflected in future deals. There is work to be done in this area, but the Finance Committee heard many examples of how Scotland's trading interests can be fully reflected in future UK-wide deals. The Scotland Office is actively involved in developing trade policy. Scotland's 59 MPs represent the interests of our trade policy in the UK Parliament, and there are monthly policy roundtables held at senior official levels to discuss trade policy. There is scope for consultation. There is scope for scrutiny and there is scope for amendments to future trade policy, but there should be no veto. Presiding officer, Scotland's trading future can be positive if the Scottish Government works together with the UK Government to enter new trade deals with fast-growing economies globally, but only in a manner that is compatible with the existing United Kingdom's devolution arrangements. I support the amendment in Adam Tompkins' name. Thank you. I call on Michael Russell to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary till decision time, please. Well, um, could I say I would have accepted the Green and Lib Dem amendments had they been called, because I think they're very compatible with the consensual debate that we've had this afternoon. And I'm grateful to all the members, apart from the members on the Tory benches, for understanding that the paper that we published, the Scotland's Role in the Development of Future UK Trade Arrangements, was a consultative paper. It was designed to uh, start the process of discussion, and I'm very glad, I'm very glad. I'm very glad that uh, that consultation has been successful, uh, unlike my use of the microphone. Um, it has been a positive debate in that regard, and I want to start with Bruce Crawford's uh, contribution, because it was a very significant one, and a number of members have mentioned it. He said that the normal approach, the normal approach, and that's what clearly the committee heard in Brussels, would be to seek consensus and to have robust formal structures to rely on. 
And the issue of formal structures was raised in this debate, I think, in every side of the chamber, by Jackie Bailey, by Tavish Scott, by Neil Bibby, um, by um, a, a range of others. And of course, the Taoiseach addressed this issue of formal structures underpinning trust very successfully at the British Irish Council. And I've quoted him here before. When he talked about the way that trust works within the EU, it works because there are formal structures which can be relied on. So all that this paper seeks to achieve is a normal approach, a normal approach to modern trade arrangements. And a number of members have made that point as well. Trade arrangements have changed in 40 or 50 years. It is important that citizens are consulted and the expectations of citizens in terms of high environmental standards, high welfare standards are reflected in trade agreements, a point that Patrick Harvey uh, made well in his opening remarks. And the only people who have stood against normality in this debate are the Conservatives. They see it as unacceptable to have any involvement of the type that's in this paper, and indeed, they think it's unacceptable even to discuss it. It is, you might call it, an eat your cereal approach. They have given up on debating what needs to change. And it's really fascinating what we heard from the Tories this afternoon, and I'm going to talk about that, because it shows what is now happening in the Brexit debate. Because the position the Tories are taking with regard, for example, to the single market is abnormal even in their own history. Let me quote a, a Lancaster House speech, not the Lanca ha Lancaster House speech, but a Lancaster House speech of April the 18th, 1988. Just think, the speech goes, the person delivering it said, for a moment, what a prospect that is. A single market without barriers, visible or invisible, giving you direct and unhindered access to the purchasing power of over 300 million of the world's wealthiest and most prosperous people. Bigger than Japan, bigger than the United States, on your doorstep and with a channel tunnel to give you perfect access to it. It's not a dream, it's not a vision, it's not some bureaucrat's plan, it's for real. That was Margaret Thatcher in 1988. <laughs> now that's the first and only time I shall ever quote her with approval in this chamber, but it does show, it does show that the Tories have turned their back not just on the modern world, they've turned their back on their own recent history. They've turned their back on the Iron Lady. And they've turned their back also even, they've turned their back even on their own positions that they held a matter of weeks or months ago, that groupthink has taken over in the Tory party. In 28th of June 2016, Adam Tompkins told this chamber, leave should mean that we remain in the EU single market. That was Adam Tompkins' vote, uh, view several days after, several days after the referendum. But as Brexit now sinks into the swamp, along with the Prime Minister, these are the last defenders of Brexit. These are the born-again Brexiteers. In fact, Adam Tompkins told us today, trying to curry favour with the, the Brexiteers, that he did think about voting for Brexit. If you read the official report, that's what he said. He wants to, in his own words, take back control of our international trading links. And when the obvious question is asked, who would that be? On what terms? Then uh, I have to say that um, another member, Gordon Lindhurst, who wouldn't take an intervention on this point, then argued that this was India. Let's look just for a second at India. The reality of the Indian trade agreement with the EU, which has not been able to be finalized for two reasons, widely admitted, one is because India wants to have continued tariffs on Scotch whisky, and the second reason is that the UK would not accept demands for access and migration, a point made by the Indian ambassador to the UK when he said they weren't in a rush to do the deal. That's a reality. This is a chimera that all these countries are waiting to do a deal. And Dean Lockhart, I think he was David Cameron's favorite Tory candidate some time ago. There he is. He's arguing now about that we are about to hand back to Brussels control. This comes from a man who voted to remain, who campaigned to remain. We are talking about collaborative work by sovereign states. And what we're actually having is knee-jerk Brexiteers on the Tory benches. It is utterly shocking. It is utterly shocking because it is very damaging. It's very damaging to Scotland and to Scottish interests what is taking place. And when people of Scotland looking round know they cannot look to the Conservatives to defend them because they have sold the Brexit pass completely. Now the reality is, and they're doing so 
also by misrepresenting the issues. There is no veto in this paper. There is consultation. There is no ban on consensus. There is a requirement for consensus. Brexit preparations, Brexit preparations for business are going ahead apace. And as Jackie Bailey pointed out in terms of the trade bill, legislative consent, which will be refused presently because of the Sewell issue, should also be refused because there has been an unbending approach to listening to the Welsh Government and the Scottish Government on issues such as membership of the Trade Remedy Authority. Presiding Officer, we have a, a, a serious paper for serious discussion. I'm grateful to the members, all the members, in all the parties except the Conservatives who have taken that point and who wish to support that debate. I think we now see what Brexit has done to the Scottish Conservatives. Drop the word Scottish. They are simply Conservatives defending the Conservative status quo, defending the most incompetent, the most ruinous, the most disastrous government that any of us can remember. A government which is now in its final days, one hopes. Just let us hope it does not drag the rest of us down with it. And the Tories sneer at this, but let them remind me of those words of Margaret Thatcher that I quoted. There was a time, there was a time when trading was seen as important. Now nothing is important except the survival of the Conservative Party. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14085 in the name of Graham Day uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Can I ask if any member objects and I call on Graham Day to move the motion. I move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one seems to object. Therefore, the question is that motion 14085 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you. Now we're going to turn to decision time, just ensure members have got their new cards insert, inserted correctly. The first question, first question is that amendment 14059.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend motion 14059 in the name of Ivan McKee on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements be agreed. Are we all agreed? Or no. not agreed? We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14059.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 29, no, 84. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The second question is that motion 14059 in the name of Ivan McKee on Scotland's role in the development of future UK trade arrangements be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to our vote again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 14059 in the name of Ivan McKee is yes, 84, no, zero. There were 29 abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Stuart McMillan on iHealth Week 2018. And we'll just take a few moments for the member and for ministers to change seats. <laughs> 